Okay, so this is um, one of the last videos for Unit 4. Here we are going to be dealing with um, the types of reactions that you see in, chem in aqueous solution. Now, we've already categorized reactions according to five main types, but it doesn't really end there. Especially in water, you have specific things that are going to happen for each reaction. And so you can further categorize those equations, okay? So we're going to be dealing with several objectives here. I'm actually splitting this section into two videos because of its length. So we're going to be talking about um, the first two oxidation reduction reactions and precipitation reactions in this video. Acid base reactions and gas evolving reactions are in the next video. So here we're going to look at how to write chemical equations for some of the reactions. We're going to look at oxidation number of atoms and compounds. And then we're going to balance redox reactions. Um, we're going to specifically do that using the half reaction method. Um, and then we're going to look at identifying reducing agent, oxidizing agent, and what, what reactant is being oxidized, what reactant is being reduced, that sort of thing. And then we're going to get into solubility and use solubility rules to predict the products in a precipitation reaction. So here's what we're doing this video. Um, again, we have acid-base reactions and everything else for this section in a later video. So for reactions in aqueous solutions, we are going to look at a more detailed categorization. Um, so double displacement reactions, we talked about those earlier. Um, we could have, those could be acid-base reactions, they could be precipitation, um, we could deal with oxidation reduction reactions. Redox reactions can be of several types too. And so we really want to get very detailed about not only what type of reaction is it overall, but what is happening to those compounds. So redox reactions occur when you have a change in the oxidation state of the elements. Um, now oxidation state is basically, um, it's like balancing your checkbook. We know how many electrons you should have. This is whether you have the right number, too few, too many, that kind of thing. Uh, redox reactions can be synthesis or single replacement reactions. Occasionally they'll be um, something else probably, but I couldn't think of examples today. Now, first we need to define what oxidation and reduction mean. There are several definitions here. Um, oxidation means that you are losing those negatively charged electrons. It is an increase in oxidation number or an increase in bonding to oxygen atoms. Um, reduction is... <laughs> Hi, Emma, where's the pause button? Uh-oh. Uh, what'd you say? Pause. Okay, so reduction is gaining electrons which are negatively charged. It's a decrease in oxidation number, or it's reducing the number of bonds um, to oxygen. Um, your reading has a couple of uh, things to help you remember. Um, oil rig is probably the one that's used most. Oil rig stands for oxidation. Is loss of electrons, while reduction is gaining electrons. Leo Ger means exactly the same thing. Here, it is losing electrons is equal to oxidation. And gaining electrons is equal to reduction. Now, when you are oxidized, well, let me say this instead. If you are being reduced in the chemical equation, it means you are gaining electrons. Now, you had to take those electrons away from someone else. 
So where you are causing someone else to be oxidized. So the substance or the reactant that is being reduced is also called, called the oxidizing agent. It's somewhat confusing because it's the opposite, but guys, I still write on my paper every single time, okay, this is being reduced, so it's the oxidizing agent. I'll do it just like that on my, my paper when I'm taking, um, when I'm practicing your exams. If you are being oxidized in the chemical equation, um, now if you're talking about what's being oxidized and reduced, you're always going to be referring to the reactant, not to the element, but to the reactant. Um, if you are being oxidized, you have lost electrons. Now those electrons aren't being destroyed, they have to go somewhere. So if you lose them, you are giving them to somebody else, causing somebody else to be reduced. So the reactant being oxidized is also called the reducing agent. Now before we can really talk about what is being oxidized and what's being reduced, we have to go through the rules for assigning oxidation numbers. Um, essentially, any element in its native state is going to be zero. So just sodium metal, H2 gas, um, those are both in their native state and they have an oxidation number of zero. The oxidation number of oxygen is usually minus two, except if you are in a peroxide compound where it's going to be minus one. Now I will tell you, we don't really use peroxides very often in um, 111 for this type of equation. Um, I try not to because they still confuse a lot of students, but that's the only exception. The oxidation number of hydrogen is plus one except in metal hydrides when it's going to be a minus one. That would be something like NaH, it would be minus one. The oxidation number of most elements in a compound is going to be the same as the charge of the ion they would form. Exceptions are going to be usually group four and eight, things like carbon or xenon. Um, and it's also going to be, if you are row three and down, and column five into the right. So things like phosphorus and sulfur will be um, exceptions. The sum of the oxidation numbers have to add up to be the charge of the overall compound. So for a neutral compound, they have to add up to be zero. For an ion, it has to be the sum of the charge. The sum has to equal the charge of the ion. So let's look at these guys. Um, these are reactions. We need to see if they are redox reactions. We're also going to go ahead and classify them all the way around. Um, and we're going to look and see um, what is being oxidized, what is being reduced, and what is the reducing and oxidizing agents. Okay, so let's look at sodium. Sodium plus chlorine goes to produce sodium chloride. go with blue for a while. What's the oxidation number of sodium? It's by itself, it's in its native state, so it's zero. Cl2 is a Hofbrinkle, so it's also zero. In this compound, we have a situation where we have um, two elements. Technically, we know that the oxidation numbers have to add up to be the charge of the compound. So I'm going to make a table, number, oxidation number, total, have to add up to be zero. We have one sodium, one chlorine. Sodium is in group one, so it has an oxidation number of plus one. Chlorine has an oxidation number of minus one, so it's got a, um, excuse me, it's in group seven, it would form a charge with, of minus one, so its oxidation number is probably minus one. Gives us a total positive oxidation number of plus one, total negative of minus one, one minus one is zero. So this is plus one, minus one. Now, this can be a little confusing here. And so I wanna go ahead and show you how I would do it on my paper. On my paper, what I would do is I would come over to the side and I would say, okay, 
sodium goes from 0 to plus 1. For chlorine, it went from 0 to minus 1. Because chlorine went from 0 to minus 1, this is being reduced. Its oxidation number went down. If it is reduced, it is also the oxidizing agent. Or actually, the, the reactant is, so we should say that Cl2 is the oxidizing agent. Sodium's oxidation number goes up, so it is being oxidized, which means that Na metal is our reducing agent. We know this is a redox reaction because you have a change in oxidation number for each element, and we can identify all of these things. Oops. Wow, interesting. I didn't know that I could do that. Um, anyway, um, so with that in mind, we know that this is a redox reaction. What other type of reaction is it? There should be a synthesis, right? We have two reactants forming one compound on the right. Let's look at this. Down here we have potassium chlorate, potassium chlorine oxygen, number, oxidation number total, has to add up to be zero. Here we have um, one potassium, one chlorine, three oxygens. According to the rules, oxygen is always minus two. Gives us a total of minus six here. Potassium is in group one, so it's going to have an oxidation number of plus one all the time. Plus one. Now, so far, we have a differential of five. This should be plus five to make it add up to be zero. There's only one chlorine, so the oxidation number here has to be plus 5. Now, at this point, we can start to say, but wait, chlorine is in group 7. It should have a charge of minus 1. That is true. But chlorine is group, oh, excuse me, chlorine is row 3 or below, and group 5 or over. So it's in uh, column 7 and it is much below the fluorine. And so we don't have to worry about this. It's an exception. So we have plus 1, plus 5, minus 2. Over here, oxygen is by itself, so it goes to 0. Chlorine goes from, well, potassium stays the same, plus 1. Chlorine is now minus 1. It's the only way to have the compound have oxidation numbers that add up to be zero. So here we have chlorine that went from plus five to minus one, and we had oxygen that went from minus two to zero. So we can tell we definitely have a redox reaction because there's a change in oxidation numbers. Now, chlorine went from 5 to minus 1, so this is being reduced. Oxygen went from negative 2 to 0, which went up, so it's being oxidized. Now, there's only one reactant here, which means this reactant is both the reducing agent and the oxidizing agent. It is the reactant causing both of those things to happen. It's just a different type of situation here. Now, hopefully you can also tell that there's one, react one reactant, two or more products. So this is also going to be a decomposition uh, reaction. OK, so let's look at these. Here, we have. Um, You know, I really won't be that mean, so we're going to leave this one off. 
Let's look at this one down here. Um, I should rewrite that, but anyway, we'll skip that one for right now. Um, copper is by itself, so this has got an oxidation number of zero. Um, over here, silver is by itself, so it's got an oxidation number of zero. Here, we have two things. The nitrate oxidation numbers have to add up to be minus one, so that's going to be, this is a plus one. Over here, nitrate still has a charge of minus one, so its oxidation numbers have to be minus one, or add up to minus one. There's two of them, so this has to be plus two. If you wanted to do the table, AgNO number, oxidation number total, one, one, three. Oxygen is minus two, gives us a minus six. Nitrogen and silver are left. Silver is usually going to be plus one. Plus one um, is what it would form as a cation, um, so that's going to be plus one. And here we have minus five, or at plus five, excuse me, for our nitrogen. Same thing would happen over here, except for copper. We now have one copper, two nitrogens, and six oxygens. All of the oxygens are minus two. All of the coppers, it's copper two uh, nitrate, so it's going to be plus two. Only way to get these to add up, minus 12 plus two, is to have a plus 10. Each one has to be uh, plus five. So silver goes from plus one to zero. Copper goes from zero to plus two. So it is definitely a redox. Silver oxidation number is going down, so this is being reduced, which means that AgNO3 is our oxidizing agent. Copper goes from zero to plus two, which means it's being oxidized. So copper solid is our reducing agent. This is also a single replacement reaction. Okay, I want you to try this and see if you can determine what um, the answers here are. I will tell you, pause right here and try it, guys. Um, this is a redox reaction. This is not. Because this is, this is going from zero to plus two. Hydrogen is going from um, plus one all the time to plus one and zero. So we have magnesium going from zero to plus two, um, which means it is being oxidized, so magnesium solid is our reducing agent. Hydrogen is going from plus one to zero when it goes from here to here, which means it is being reduced, and so water is our oxidizing agent. Okay? Um, There we go. When you are balancing redox reactions, balancing these is slightly different than balancing other chemical equations because you don't always have um, the full compound present. And so what you're going to do is you're going to write the half reactions, which are the reactions that only involve um, the same substance or the same containing substance. Then you're going to balance the reactions, the half reactions, for everything except oxygen and hydrogen. You balance oxygen by adding water. You balance hydrogen by adding H plus. And then you're going you're gonna to multiply the half reactions to make sure they have an equal number of um, electrons. And then you can add the two together to get the overall. 
So for example, here we have um, a dichromate plus nitrite going to chromium-3 plus nitrate. Um, and so we could split these into two different reactions. Um, let's see, how do I want to do this? Let's do a color. Let's go with chromium, dichromate, the chromium-containing compounds. And then I'm going to come, oops, and do this as well. Let's do it in blue. Nitrite going to nitrate. Okay. Up here, chromiums are not equal. So we need to go ahead and add a 2 over here. Now we have equal chromiums. Down here, nitrogens are balanced. Oxygen, it says not to worry about yet. Once we've balanced everything except oxygen and hydrogen, we're going to add oxygen to the side missing oxygen. Uh, we're going to add water to the side missing oxygen, sorry. So we need 7 here, so plus 7 H2Os. Chromiums are balanced, oxygen and hydrogen. 2 and 2, 7 and 7. Now we have 14 hydrogens over here. So we're going to come over and add 14 hydrogens over here. At this point, you can go through and look at um, the number of electrons that you need, okay? But before we do that, let's go ahead and finish balancing the bottom half reaction. So down here, we have nitrite and nitrate. So we're going to add an H2O over here, and that is going to give us a um, need. So we have nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, one and one, three and three, two. So we're going to add two H pluses here. Okay. Now, when we do that, we are going to have um, basically uneven charges. Okay. Um, in order to make it balanced, over here we have 2 times 3 is plus 6. Over here we have 14 positives, um, 2 negatives, so 14 minus 2 is 12 pluses. We only want it to be equal, so we want the plus 6 on both sides. So we're going to add 6 electrons over here. Down here, we have a negative and a negative, but we also have two positives. So we need to add two electrons over here. Now we have two and two cancel. This one and this one cancel. We're good to go. Um, at this point, we can compare the number of electrons in each equation. We have six up here, but only two down here, so we need to multiply by three. So that's going to give us three waters, three nitrites, three nitrates, three times two is six hydrogens, three times two is six electrons. Okay? We have the same number of electrons. We can add them up. We get six electrons. Everything on the left of the arrow will stay on the left, plus 14 H pluses, plus Cr2O7 2 minus, plus three waters, plus three nitrites. On the right, we have two chromium threes, plus seven waters, plus three uh, nitrates, plus six hydrogens, plus six electrons. Now, we can cancel anything that's the same on both sides, which means we get to cancel these six electrons. We get to cancel six of the hydrogens, so that's going to leave us with eight over here. We get to cancel three waters, so that's going to leave us with four. And it's going to give us overall eight H pluses 
plus dichromate. Oops, that's a 7. 2 minus. Plus 3 nitrites goes to 2 chromium 3s. Plus 4 waters. Plus 3 nitrates. And that is our balanced equation. We can do the same thing here. Oops. There should be an arrow right there. Um, I'm really sorry it's not there. So our two half reactions are the one containing carbon. So HCOOH going to carbon dioxide. Down here we have MnO4 negative going to Mn2+. Carbons are balanced, magnesiums are balanced. So let's go ahead, we're going to have a list of our elements. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, magnesium, oxygen, hydrogen. Um, one and one. Oxygen is two and two. So we just need to add two H pluses over here. two and two. And because of our charge differential, we're going to add two electrons. Neutral over here, two positives, two negatives. Down here, we have one manganese on each side, four oxygens, which means we need four waters. Now we have eight hydrogens, so we're going to add eight, elect um, mm -hmm -hmm, eight hydrogens over here. And then we need to look at our electrons. Over here we have 2 plus. Over here we have 7 plus. So we need to add 5 electrons. I guess I should put the positive and the plus after. Now, in order to make this balance, we need to multiply to get the same number of electrons in both half reaction. So we're going to multiply up here by 5. Multiply down here by 2, and I'm going to rewrite it so that it's a little less um, crowded. So that gives us 5HCOOH going to 5CO2s plus 10 hydrogens plus 10 electrons. Down here we have 10 electrons plus 16 hydrogens plus 5 MnO4s. And that's all going to, oops, that should be a 2. That's where the dyslexia gets me sometimes. Um, right, everything else is good. 2 magnesiums, manganese plus 8 waters. Okay, now um, as we are doing this, you can add it up or you can go ahead and cancel first. I'm going to go ahead and cancel first just because it's getting kind of um, crazy. Um, let's go back to purple. 10 electrons cancel. 10 of these hydrogens cancel, meaning we're left with 6. Um, No waters cancel, so we're left with 5-HCOOH plus 2-MnO4 negative plus 6-H pluses going to 5-CO2s plus 2-Mn2 pluses plus 8 waters. And that is our balanced equation. If you are struggling with balancing redox equations, there is a ton of practice online, or you can post to the help forum, and I will post some extra help. Now, let's move to the next type of reaction. Precipitation reactions are double, repl double displacement or double replacement reactions <laughs> that occur when one of the products 
um, forms an insoluble solute. Um, so here we have AB plus CD goes to AD plus CB. Um, an example would be something like silver nitrate reacting with magnesium chloride to produce magnesium nitrate and silver chloride solid. The only way to really figure out what your insoluble compound is, is to memorize these solubility rules. So your solubility rules um, are given in your text this way. I kind of summarize them in a table. Nitrates, group one metals, ammoniums, and acetate compounds are always soluble. Doesn't matter, they are always soluble. Um, chloride, bromide, iodide compounds are soluble unless they're paired with silver, mercury, or lead. If you have any of these three with any of those anions, they become insoluble. Barium, calcium, mercury, and lead make the usually soluble sulfate compounds insoluble. Hydroxides are usually not soluble, but if they're paired with a group one metal, ammonium, calcium, or barium, you suddenly be get, get a soluble compound, okay? Um, and then most insoluble compounds, um, sulfides, carbonates, chromates, um, phosphates will, are going to be soluble. So they'll be pulled into solution if they are paired with group one metals or ammonium. Now guys, um, I tried to simplify and give you only the six that really get used the most this semester. There are a lot of rules out there where things are slightly soluble or kind of soluble or slightly insoluble, and I tried to eliminate a lot of that. Um, so if you go looking for extra help, make sure you are eliminating the rules that I'm not including here. So use the solubility rules to predict what is going to be the precipitate. Barium hydroxide, if we go back to our soluble solubility table, hydroxides are usually not soluble, but with barium, they are, so this is aqueous. Sulfates are usually soluble. Potassium compounds are always soluble. Doesn't matter, guys. The precipitate should be on the right. It, should only, it only matters if it's on the right. Um, but let's look at these really quick. Um, barium sulfate. Sulfates are usually soluble, but with barium, it's not. So this is our solid. And this is going to be aqueous because group one metals are always aqueous. Acetate compounds are always soluble. Um, I probably should have put this example after the acid um, portion, but because this is a reasonably strong acid, this is soluble, so it's aqueous. And even if you put it as solid, it wouldn't matter because we're not looking for what you start with, we're looking for the precipitate at the end. Acetate compounds are always soluble, so this is aqueous. Going back to confirm, phosphates are usually not soluble. And iron is not an exception, so this is our solid here. Potassium compounds are always soluble, or you could say nitrate compounds are always soluble. Mercury chloride. Technically, this starts off as a solid, right? Chloride is soluble except with mercury or lead or silver. Potassium compounds are always soluble. Nitrate compounds are always soluble. So this is not even a precipitation reaction. Now, a lot of times we want to simplify the chemical equation. Remember, I always say that chemists are lazy. Um, the chemical equation that we learned in unit three gives us the entire overall picture. It tells us what reacted, what our products are, but that's it. The complete ionic equation gives us every substance that's present in its form, in the right form in solution, which is really long to write. And so we typically go with the net ionic equation. 
You guys are going to be doing that in lab for lab, the lab on reactions. I don't remember which lab number it is. Um, but you will here only write what is going to undergo a change. So let's look at this. This is the chemical equation, um, or, or sometimes called the molecular equation. We have a balanced equation here. We need to go ahead and determine what is soluble and what isn't. We know that potassium compounds group 1 is always soluble. Barium makes hydroxide soluble, but barium sulfite, sulfate is not. So that's our solid. Now, we can then write the complete ionic equation by breaking everything into its form. Um, let's go ahead and change this. For these, I try to keep my arrow in the same place. Now, because barium hydroxide is aqueous, it really splits apart into barium 2 plus and two hydroxides. Potassium sulfate is aqueous, so it splits into two K pluses plus a sulfate. Now guys, I should have aqueous after every single one of these. The problem is I don't have enough room to write that here, but you should have it. Barium sulfate is a solid. It does not break apart. So it is barium sulfate solid. Um, potassium hydroxide is aqueous, so you get two K pluses and two hydroxides, just like that. And then what you do is you get rid of your spectator ions, or the ions that are not going to participate, that are present on both sides. For us, that is going to be hydroxide and potassium. And it leaves us with the net ionic equation of barium 2 plus aqueous plus sulfate aqueous reacting to form barium sulfate solid. And this is our net ionic equation. Now, a few seconds ago, we just did this, so we know that this is now aqueous, aqueous, solid, and aqueous. And so this is going to give us the complete ionic equation of iron 2 plus. I know that this is 2 plus because if you have to, you can make a table. This is a minus 1. There's two of them. It has to be plus 2. Plus 2 acetate ions aqueous plus 3 H pluses plus phosphate aqueous reacting to form Fe3PO4 to solid plus this isn't balanced is it should be a 3, 2, and 6. So 3 of these, 6 of these, 6 of these, and 2 of those. And now we also have 6 acetate ions over here, aqueous, and six H pluses over here. That being said, we can look at what cancels. Our spectator ions are going to be the same on both sides. So our acetates cancel, our hydrogens cancel, and we're going to be left with the net ionic equation of three iron two pluses reacting with two phosphate ions to produce iron two phosphate. 
solid, just like that. Same thing here, the net ionic equation for this guy is going to be, um, we know that everything here is aqueous. And basically, even if we write it out, K plus, oops, two K pluses plus two nitrates plus mercury plus two chlorines going to two K pluses plus two Cl minuses plus mercury plus two nitrates. Everything here is a spectator ion, which means our net ionic equation is no reaction. Okay. That is the end of this video. We have one more um, for the this uh, unit.